بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا حبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful program. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the blessing that is descending upon us. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said Allah has put blessing in three things. He's put blessing in time, in places, and in people. And as we know, barakah is translated as increase, meaning that whatever acts of worship are done during these time or by these people or in these places are going to have an increase from Allah, the likes by which we would not be able to imagine, nor would we be able to measure. And so subhanAllah, in the days of Dhul Hajjah, the Prophet وسلم, said that these are the most blessed days of the entire year. And when the companions asked the Prophet وسلم, in comparing it to the month of Ramadan, the Prophet وسلم, said the last 10 nights of Ramadan are the most Mubarak nights of the year. But the 10 days of the Hajjah, those first 10 days are the most Mubarak, the most Mubarak days, blessed days of the entire year. And so when this blessing reign, as we would call it, right, the provisions of Allah is descending, provisions for our mind, our body, and more importantly, for our soul. When this blessed rain is descending, there are three types of people. There are those who go out and they recognize the rain. They recognize what's happening, but they go out and they dance and they sing in the rain and they're so excited about it, right? but yet they don't collect any of its blessings. That only what they have is that which was, has fallen upon them. And there's a second group of people who says there is a blessed mubarak rain that is descending. Let me go collect some of it also while it's falling on me. And they at least take a cup and say, at least so I would have some for later. Like the people who package uh, Zamzam in bottles and take it on planes with them, that they want to make sure that they take some of that blessing of what they've experienced home with them. And then there's a third type of people. A type of people who said, I can see that there is a rain that's coming. And they dig a trench. They make sure that they dig deep and wide so that when the rain descends, they have something by which they're able to collect that rain. Not only are they going to benefit themselves for the next day, they're going to benefit their neighbors and their community by it. They're going to irrigate their lands by it. They're going to make sure that their cattle and animals are fed by it, that all who come into contact with them would be blessed by the blessings that they collected. And so when we look at the beautiful days of Dhul Hajjah that are upon us, we have to make sure that as it approaches, that we're the people who dig a trench, that we prepare, that we're ready, that we recognize what these days offer. So part of what makes these blessed days, of course, Mubarak, is that number one, that the day of Arafah is from amongst them. The day of Arafah, when the pilgrims are normally standing on Jabal Rahma, standing at the mountain of mercy, doing nothing except saying, La bayk, Allahumma la bayk. Here I am, O Allah, at your service, presenting myself to you, giving all that I am and presenting all that I'm not, but saying, O Allah, I am your servant. Number me, count me from amongst the Muslims. They stand there on, on Arafat, giving up, pouring out their souls to Allah, saying, Oh Allah, accept me to be from amongst those who believe. They're praying for themselves, their families, their neighbors. They're praying for the entire world. It is from the dua of these who judge that we are deeply sustained by that robotic reign throughout the year that our provisions are granted, that our sins are forgiven. As they say, Allahumma faghfir lana kulli dhunubana wa faghfir al-muslimin wa al-muslimat. Oh Allah, forgive the Muslims, the Muslim men and the Muslim women. Answer their du'as. Those are the days that we're approaching. The days of sacrifice. The days where we literally have to learn what it means to put our to put our money where our mouth is, 
that that which we've been working for, that which we've been saving, that which we've been gathering, we're now saying, Ya Rabbi, now that you've given this provision to me, here I am giving it back to you. Saying, I present my hard work, the tangible evidence of my work, of my time, of my ingenuity. I'm presenting it back to you, Ya Allah. Those are the days that we are upon. And as we look at the beautiful story that brings us there of the first family, we're reminded of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and our two mothers, Mother Hajar and Mother Sara, and their Mubarak children, Ismail and Ishaq. And this first family starts off with a father who's already from the time that he's young has dedicated himself in the service of Allah saying, Ya Allah, right? I, will, I will walk and spread the earth teaching people what it means to, to believe in Tawheed. Teaching people that you can be freed from, from the oppressiveness of worshiping idols. The disappointedness of laying all of your cares and your concerns, your worries, your fears, your happiness at the feet of that which cannot even hear you or respond to your needs. You're, he, he's, he's walking throughout the earth saying, let me call you to the one who will respond to your call. Let me teach you about the one who actually has the ability to create that which it is you, you need and that you're seeking. The one who actually has the ability to answer your prayers and to provide you solutions to your problems. What Prophet Ibrahim السلام, from the time that he's very young is doing is that as, he, as he's traveling through the earth and teaching people about la ilaha illallah and, and smashing idols and saying don't worship these idols, he's also teaching us about do not, you, you too can be free from the tyranny of oppressive kings. You too can be free from the oppressiveness of tyrants. That you have a Lord that is full of mercy and generosity, of kindness, and who will guide you aright. Let me introduce you to him. And so subhanAllah, we know that it's not until after Prophet Ibrahim السلام, of course, is old and gray that him and our beloved mother Sarah, as they are also making dua, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, is making dua, oh Allah, don't leave me alone. Hey, bless me with an offspring that we may be numbered amongst those, the first who submit, that we may be numbered amongst those who believed in you, who submitted to you, who get whose prayers and sacrifices, whose life and death were for you. Ya Allah, bless us with a righteous progeny. And Sara, our be his beloved wife and our beloved mother, recognizes that if I am barren, if I don't have the ability to bring forth a child, revelation shouldn't stop. She recognizes that if a prophet has a child, then his child would be able to continue in the legacy of spreading that risala, of spreading the message. And so out of her love and concern for wahi, out of her love and concern for revelation and making sure that it doesn't stop and making sure that humanity is not, is not depleted of the blessing of revelation, she even says, this, this matter is bigger than me. It's bigger than my ability or my inability. It's greater than that. And so she turns when the she turns to her, her husband and the Prophet, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, and she tells him, Take my servant Hajar, right, as your wife and have a child with her. Do your best to have a child with her. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Prophet Ibrahim, I'm going to bless your seed to equal the sands of the seashore. I'm going to bless you to be the father of many nations. And so subhanAllah, when our mother Hajar and Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam is gifted with Ismail, subhanAllah, the beginning of that risala, carrying the torch, carrying on the, uh, the banner, passing on the baton of righteousness, of taqwa, of risala, of this message continues. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam a commandment 
to take his beloved wife Hajar and their child Ismail to take them to the desert. This is a commandment from Allah. Keep that in mind. That as he's walking then with his wife and child up mountains and down mountains and through valleys, bearing, of course, the serious heat of the desert sun and then continuing to climb these mountains and descend these mountains and go through these rocky valleys, he arrives at the middle of the earth. He arrives at a place that even himself, he doesn't know is the place of the, the first establishment of worship. But Allah knows what secret he's hiding. And Allah tells him, this is where you're going to leave your wife and child. And so as Ibrahim realizes that this is Allah's commandment and whether he can fully understand the magnitude of how Allah Azawajal is about to bless him, what he does understand is that if Allah has commanded me, that you will find me to be from amongst those who are obedient. You will find me to be from amongst those who are in submission. And he begins to walk away. And as he walks away and our mother Hajj calls out to him, Ya Ibrahim, where are you going? And Prophet Ibrahim, he doesn't answer. He says, Ya Ibrahim, where are you going? And Prophet Ibrahim, he doesn't answer. Ya Ibrahim, where are you going? And he doesn't answer. And finally she says, Ah, oh, did Allah command you to do this? And he stops and he says, yes. Allah has commanded me to do this. And she says, has me Allah, that Allah is sufficient for me. Then I know she has, a, she has this stance of absolute yaqeen. She has a certainty that it, despite what it looks like, that you're leaving me in a barren, desolate land. I know that my Lord, the one who commands me, right, the one who has commanded you, will command me to be well taken care of. He is sufficient for me. And she takes her stance of faith right there. She knows that Allah is going to bless her. She knows that her back is not against any wall. She understands that with this, when you have to walk, pull, and trust in Allah, Allah will never let you down. And so, subhanAllah, she literally says, but let me have adab with Allah. And what's known in our tradition in the books that actually night falls. And I can't imagine what it must feel like for the night to fall, for the water to run out, for the food to run out, and you're with a child. And she says, let me have some adab, some manners with Allah that I don't just sit with a sense of entitlement. I don't just sit and wait for this blessing to fall on me. She says, let me, let me go search. I know it's here. I'm certain that it's here. Let me see if is it coming behind this mountain or is it coming by this mountain? So she goes, of course, she runs to Safa and then she runs to Marwa. As we know the story, she does this seven times. The same amount of times, of course, that we make Sa'i, but also the same amount of times that we make Tawaf around the Kaaba. The same, this same seven. That subhanAllah, she does this act of worship, this act of yaqeen, this act of certainty, this act of reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. And what does Allah do? He sends the angel Jibra'in alayhi salam to come crack open the earth for her and to pour forth the well of Zamzam. As if the, the fountain of faith inside her heart became manifest on the earth. As if the fountain of her faith not only began to be a nourishment for her, but for a healing for all of us. The angel Jibrail then allows this water to flow and she says, Zem, 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 stop. Like she's trying to collect it. Very similar to what we talked about when Baraka is descending. What do we do? We want to collect it so that we make sure we have something of it for the next day for tomorrow. Then subhanAllah, her and her child are able to drink from it. More time passes. And as there's now an oasis in the desert, there are birds that come 
overhead and begin to flock. And the tribe of Jotham that's traveling in the distance follows, tracks these birds and says, there must be water somewhere nearby. And they trace themselves all the way back to our mother Hajar. And as they arrive at this woman and this child in the middle of the desert, they ask her, can we stay here? Can we remain here? And she makes that beautiful statement where she says, yes, but I control the water. This statement alone is enough to be studied. Yes, you can stay. I recognize you as a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent them along her way for company, but she has the strength and the courage and the fortitude of faith to say, I know in this moment, it may look like that I'm a weak, vulnerable woman with a child in a desperate situation and that I could be overtaken. But what she recognizes is a secret that unless you know Allah well, you might miss it. She knows that with Allah, you are the majority. That if Allah al-Mateen al-Qawi al-Qadir is standing with her and she's standing with Allah, that if she is being a witness for Allah, Allah would never allow her to be harmed or to be, uh, to be mistreated. And so she says, she has khasim al She has good opinion of Allah. And she stakes her claim teaching us that when Allah gives you a blessing that's for you, you can share it, but you don't give it away. You can share it with other people. They can benefit from it. They can be nourished by it. They can be healed by it, but recognize it's a gift that was given to me and it is a part of my khilafah, a part of my imamah, a part of my responsibility to, with Allah that I'm the one who takes care of that I'm the one who remains in control of it. Not because I'm ego tripping, not because I'm a control freak, but because I have a responsibility to be a, to a caretaker of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. And I follow in that legacy. That's what she's saying. And what does Allah do for her? As a stance of her yaqeen, as a stance of her tawakkul, as a stance of her husn al her good opinion of Allah, but also her stance of faith, of strength, of confidence in Allah, while at the same time having compassion for them, right? And saying, yes, you can stay with me and being willing to share that. What does Allah do? He literally builds the holiest city around her. He literally builds her the, a city where subhanAllah, then later her husband traveling on Barak, then later her husband traveling on the Barak would, uh, would come and visit her and that she would be instructed subhanAllah with uh, her son uh, Ismail to build, right? The Prophet Ibrahim salam, and Ismail would be told to build the Kaaba, right? will be subhanAllah rebuilding the first house of worship that Adam alayhi salam built. Reestablishing, rededicating the house of Allah. Establishing the earth for Allah's sake. This city is built around her. And even till today in 2021, when people go and make hajj or they make umrah and they're making tawaf around the Kaaba, they're, they're, her grave is there. Her grave, her grave is subhanAllah, her and Ismail, their graves are there. Assalamu alaikum ya mother hajar. Assalamu alaikum ya muslima. Wal mu'mina. Wal saliha. Assalamu alaikum. Allah literally makes it an inst he builds an institution of faith where she is included, that we cannot complete our the rites of Hajj, which is our fifth pillar of Islam. You cannot complete your faith. Your faith is your, your acts of, of worship to Allah are not complete if you can afford it, except that you walk in the footsteps of our mother Hajar. Except that you run from Safa and Marwa, having yaqeen, have, having yaqeen, having tawakul, Throwing the dunya behind your back and saying, Ya Rabbi, la bayk, Allahumma la bayk. Here I am at your service. And so subhanAllah, of course, the son that she's raising, Ismail, would understand this spirit of sacrifice. Of course, 
She would raise a man that would grow up to be a prophet that would understand this level of obedience to Allah. Of course, she would raise the kind of son that would say, I would give my life in service to Allah. I would do whatever it is he asked me. And so subhanAllah, when the Prophet Ibrahim sees the vision, he sees the dream of him sacrificing his son, you will find, he says, he's, he's on it. He quickly, he goes and tells his son. His son says, Ismail, and he said, you will find me from those who are obedient, oh father. Right? SubhanAllah. And then as he's about to do it, and they're both willing, that Prophet Ibrahim, after having begged Allah Azza wa Jal for a son, is willing to say, Ya Rabbi, you gave him to me, I give him back to you. He was yours to begin with. Hey, SubhanAllah. He's ready to sacrifice, and Allah then sends him a ram. Like what we're going to do. Sacrifice a ram and then give it out. Allah is saying, I'm not asking for your son. I don't really want your son. I want, I want the world to know to the end of time what it means to stand up and bear witness that my prayers and my sacrifices, my life and my death are all for Allah. What it means to have duriyat salih what it means to have a righteous progeny. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Ibrahim, I want the world to know who your wife is. What it means to be a righteous woman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I want the world to know what it means that when you take a stance for Allah, not only will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of you in the moment, but that he will build entire institution around you. That there will be people in years to come beyond 5,000 years it takes for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be born in this place. For the Quran to be revealed in this place. For Hajj, the rites of Hajj to be implemented in this place. And it would be thousands of years even more after that. That we would still be following during the same rites, doing our best to do just have an, a smidgen of the faith of this woman. to build our families around the design of this first family. So as we approach the days of Dhul Hajjah, we also recognize that in Hajjah's sacrifice and in Sarah's sacrifice, 14 years after that, Ishaq is born in Palestine and Jerusalem in the Quds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then begins to build up this holy city. Giving Sarah for her sacrifice of her husband, giving him to Hajar. This city is built, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't forget the sacrifice of Sarah. And he, he builds Al-Quds around her sacrifice, around her stance of faith, around her stance of yaqeen. She has her own son, Ishaq. And then from there, later we get Masjid Al-Aqsa. That from this family of faith, the two holiest cities, like technically all three of the holiest cities on earth are built around this family. That Allah gives them Fath and Mubina. He gives them a manifest victory that lasts into 2021. And just as it was upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pick up the baton and to make sure that legacy wasn't left behind, but to push the agenda of true faith, of pure faith, of fitrah forward. It is our job to pick up that baton. Whether we are the pilgrims standing on Arafat or not, it is our job to pick up the baton, the baton of faith and say, Labaik, Allahumma labaik. Here I am, O Lord, at your service. Use me as you wish. I'm raising my hands, Ya Rabbi, you will find me amongst those who submit. Why? So all those who are around may have access to the call, may have access to the rahmah, to the mercy, to the barakah, to the blessed rains that are descending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the recipients, not only of that Mubarak rain, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those, the warat al-anbiya, those who are the inheritors of the anbiya, who inherit, who in inherit this legacy and who build upon it and who build our families 
around this stance of faith, with tawakkum, with yaqeen, doing nothing except pushing the agenda of la ilaha illallah forward. Jazakumullah khairin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.